Good morning. Glad to be with you today. And we're going to be in Psalm 14, uh, which sort of answers the question, what is the biggest lie that you've ever heard? What's the biggest lie you could ever tell yourself? Psalm 14. It's an amazing psalm, and it's sort of a, a psalm where David just gets after people who don't know or acknowledge God. A very important time for us to be studying this psalm in this day and in our age. So let's pray, and we'll get into psalm. Heavenly Father, thank you for this wonderful psalm, this song of David, and we pray that we might understand uh, how the folly and the wickedness of mankind is so great and so blinding to your grace and your mercy and your presence. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Have you ever thought about all the lies that you've been told? You know, uh, it doesn't matter, somebody says. Well, it does matter. They wouldn't be upset. Or uh, there's no such thing as whatever. And uh, we, we're told lies many times in our lives, aren't we? But the greatest lie that you can ever hear or the greatest lie that you can ever tell yourself is this. Well, there is no God. I want to read Psalm 14 as we think about this today. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They have committed abominable deeds. There is no one who does good. The Lord looked down from heaven upon the sons of men to see if there was anyone who understands or, or any who understands. He said, who seek after God. They've all turned aside. Together they become corrupt. There is no one who does good, not even one. Do all the workers of the wickedness not know who eat up by people as they eat bread and do not call upon the name of the Lord? They, there, there they are in great dread, for God is with the righteous generation. You would put to shame the counsel of the afflicted, but the Lord is his refuge. Oh, that the salvation of Israel would come out of Zion. When the Lord restores his captive people, Jacob will rejoice. Israel will be glad. The writer of Proverbs says, The beginning of wisdom is the fear of God. David takes another turn on this, and he says, A fool is a person who says there is no God. Why would he say that? Well, first of all, he knows God, and he knows the reality of God. And secondly, he looks around at all the alternatives to God in this world, and it's amazing to him. How would somebody worship a little statue or some idea uh, or some man-made God, some half-God, half-man like the Greeks and Romans worshiped, or some statue with uh, snakes and all kind of things coming out of it uh, who can't even speak to you? Uh, he says, religiously, it's untenable. That God cannot do anything for you. Those gods will never satisfy the soul, will never forgive a sin, will never cause a person to be born again. It's the greatest lie. Philosophically, and I guess logically, it's untenable. <clears throat> I've had people uh, debate with me in times past, not so much lately, but in times past, and people would say, well, there is no God and uh, you can't prove it. And I said, but I can prove one thing. Uh, for you to be able to say there is no God, then you must be able to know everything. Oh, well, and if you know everything, then wouldn't that make you God? And then they usually get off on that and they'll say, well, uh, you know, I don't think there's a God. Well, that's a different thing. It's one thing to be honest enough to say, I hope there's no God, or I don't think there's a God. I haven't come to that conclusion yet. It's another thing uh, to make, that, to make you know, that statement. It's like the lady on an airplane one time uh, who we were talking about life, and as you often used to do on airplanes, you don't do it anymore, but we were talking about life and whatever, and uh, she said to me, she was an educator, and she said to me, uh, when I asked about uh, what uh, moral basis or truth basis did she teach, and she said, well, there's no absolute truth. Your truth is your truth, and my truth is, is my truth. And I said, that's an interesting statement. You've just made an absolute truth claim when you said there is no absolute truth. That's an absolute statement. And if that's true, then it would have to be absolutely true, wouldn't it? And uh, she was a bit confused after that, and uh, we talked on and we had a good conversation. But for a person to say there is no God, uh, I think it's an untenable thing. And what I've discovered about people who claim to be atheists 
is this. They want to sin. They want to sin with no repercussions. They don't want to think about their lives having any accountability to a God who is holy and righteous and doesn't sin and to people who they might affect and hurt. They want to live their lives like they want to live. They want to believe what they want to believe and they want to do what they do. But inevitably, when you declare this, your life is wide open to the sins that surely follow. Listen to what David writes. He said, they're corrupt. They have committed abominable deeds. There is no one who does good. That's so impressive that Paul picks this up in chapter 3 of Romans, the whole litany here, and then he finally concludes that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God because nobody does good. Listen, once you declare your independence from your maker, you're, no, you're, you're in a perilous position. You, you have no more standing before God than Adam and Eve had. You have no more standing than Satan has. And you're going to end up ruining your life and wrecking your life because you don't know everything. You can't know the future, so how do you know your decisions today are going to be good decisions? You can't overcome the past regrets and decisions you have by saying it doesn't matter. That's a lie, one of the big lies that you tell yourself. It doesn't matter. So many people have told me, and you've heard it too, haven't you? Somebody comes along and says, well, I'm doing this privately, this, uh, this abominable thing privately, but it's not hurting anyone. Of course it hurts everyone. Sin has a wide net that's cast, and you bring it into your family, you bring it into your marriage, you bring it into your, 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 your parenting, you bring it into the way you work or don't work. And that's what David is saying. When you say there's no God, you become corrupt. Now, if we were to turn to Romans chapter 1, it's a very clear path. The Bible says that people, in fact, know that there is a God. They know it innately or intuitively within. God's placed that within everybody who's created. And they know it from nature, the witness of nature. So you have an internal witness and you have an external witness. How you can look at the human body and how it functions, or how you can look at nature and how it reproduces itself, or how you can imagine that a fish could swim in the sea and uh, not, not uh, uh, expire or be drowned or whatever, and just think that that's just the way it is, and nature itself, some unnamed, undisclosed force, is not to be reckoned with, makes you a fool, an absolute fool. And so it corrupts you. So uh, Paul writes in Romans chapter 1, he says, Instead of honoring God for creating them and the world around them, or thanking God and reverencing God and wanting to be in relationship to God, it said they turn within themselves and God gives them over to this depraved mind. And so they begin to worship something. They worship images of man. They really worship themselves. That's the problem. We all want to be God. And until we realize we can never be God, we can never be independent, until we realize we are under his authority and subjugation, and that is the thing that will free us to be who we really need to be and want to be, although we don't recognize it and can't, re can't realize it. Until that, he said, we're just going to go on and spiral downward. And he said, ne next they're worshiping, you know, animals and, and uh, insects and birds and finally nothing at all. And then he said, God gives them over to a depraved mind. Once you, listen, once anyone says there is no God, their mind has become depraved. Now, I don't mean by that that they don't have some goodness about them when we fall away from God. It's not that we don't have any goodness, not that we can't think. Uh, a lot of people who are running from God are brilliant people. A lot of people uh, who are running from God have uh, a tenderness about their lives. But, but they go on a spiral down for, downward. And so God says, first of all, they begin to do unnatural things unnatural things. Uh, their, their desire becomes unnatural. And then they, they do all sorts of things. And finally, Paul concludes in Romans chapter 1, he says, not only do they do those things, but they encourage and rejoice and enjoy others doing those things. Well, if you're doing something that's a self, that, that, that makes your life self-destructive, and you enjoy that, and, and you celebrate that with other people, then you're going to lead them to have a destructive life also. When you destroy your life away from an humble submission to the Lord, not only do you ruin your life and the lives of others in this world, but you're lost in the next world. That's the sadness of it all.
You know, I think as believers, we need to stop here for a minute. And instead of uh, jumping on a mountaintop and declaring, we are right, we have the answer, and all these people are wrong and condemn folks and uh, have a judgmental attitude for those folks. No, just acknowledge it for what it is. They're fools. And what they knew, need is for God, by the Holy Spirit and by the Word of God and by the witness that we can give them, they need God to work in their lives so that they can turn from their blindness and their death to a living God. Listen to what he says. They're corrupt. They've committed abominable deeds. It's spiritually false, you see, to say that it doesn't matter. Wicked deeds, we read. Wicked deeds. Now, you wouldn't think it would always be like that. But I tell you, this is the way it is. I think until you get so far away from God that your heart, as the scripture says, is carterized or, or hardened, if you will, I think there's a, a period of time where people have good intentions. They, they don't intend to uh, leave their spouse. They don't intend to abuse their children or neglect them. Uh, they, they don't intend to lie. And they don't intend to uh, take advantage of other people and advantage of situations and whatever. They don't intend to steal, but they do it anyway. Something is uh, happening in their lives. They're spiritually dead, and they're pawns of the devil, the god of this world, as the Bible says, this roaring lion that seeks those who may devour. Satan is a liar, but he's also the instrument of death. Satan is the one telling people, you don't have any hope in this world. Go ahead and take your life. Cut yourself. Go off into the black arts, if you will. Satan is the one that's always lying to us, telling us these lies that we're no good, we're beyond redemption. It's always going to be like this. Those are lies. And, and, and once you start down the pathway of lying by denying God, then there's no end and no limit to the lies that you will follow and believe. The lie that says, I'd be much happier if I was out of this situation. I'd be much happier. You know, somebody told me recently of a Christian man who's been in ministry for many years who told his, this friend of his, as he was telling me, he called him one day and he said, you know, I wanted you to know that I'm now identifying as a female. Now, he's been in ministry for over 20 years. I'm identifying as a female and I'm leaving my wife and I'm leaving my children to go down this path because I think it's best for me. And so uh, I thought about that. My friend said, I don't know what to tell him. I said, let's go back to the Christian part. He continues to say, I'm a Christian, right? And so when he married, he pledged as a Christian to support his wife and to protect his wife and to love his wife. And now he's saying, I'm not going to do that. And then he said, I, as a father, he was going to protect his little girls. He was going to love them. And now he doesn't want to live with them anymore because he's chosen a life that's unnatural for him. You say, oh, well, people are free to do what they want to do. Of course you're free to do what you want to do. This is America. You, you, can, you can identify with whatever you want to identify, but to claim that you're a Christian and abandon people and abandon the sacredness of a family and a marriage to identify with a way of selfishness in your life is being a fool, is living a lie. Oh, I, I pray for this man. I really do that he might come to his senses. Once again, is he free to do that? Yes, he is. But he's not free to claim the name of Jesus Christ and saying that God is leading him to do this and will eventually bless him to do this. He's telling himself a lie. And I suspect that the God of this world got to him first and told him his lies. Oh, I don't deny that people have all kind of proclivities, all kind of uh, desires that they, they fight and whatever. Only God, the God who loves us, the God who created us, the God who sent Jesus to die for us, and the God who gave us the Holy Spirit so that we can live in holiness and righteousness of the truth. Only God can deliver us, delivers me, delivers you, delivers anybody. I don't judge those uh, folks that live a lie. I, I don't judge people that are uh, doing abominable acts. I don't like them. I don't like them, to, uh, the acts. I, I don't like them to do that. But I don't judge those people. I want them to come to see the light of the truth. I pray God will break into their lives and send somebody into their lives that will turn them from the lie to the truth. 
And it's not just this whole gender thing in America today. What about abortion? And what about the lies that go on in this world? What about the crookedness that we see? Uh, what, what, about, what about all these things that just keep our nation in turmoil? It could all be straightened out if people knew the truth and how to live by the truth and how to depend upon God to live out the truth of their lives. He says they're doing nothing good. Well, of course, he doesn't mean that people don't do anything that are good. We have many charitable things in this world uh, that are just absolutely wonderful as they take care of humans in distress and in need. But in terms of God, they're doing nothing good because they cannot. Only God is good, forever and ever good. You and I have experienced sin, which has ruined the goodness in us, we may have what we would call vestiges of goodness left over, vestiges of kindness, vestiges of, of, of tenderheartedness, but only God is good. And when I compare my life to God, without Jesus Christ, there's nothing good in my life. It takes the mercy of God and the power of the cross and the power of the resurrection and the presence of the Holy Spirit in my life to keep me in balance I'm no better than anybody else in this world, save for the fact that I know God the Father through Jesus Christ. Then he goes on to say, they lack understanding. It's amazing to me how people who get people into trouble think that they can get them out of that trouble. I, 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 we see this all the time. So we have a, we have a Congress, and uh, they have uh, put us in debt, a national debt. I, I didn't ask anybody to do the trillions and trillions of dollars in the debt. And so they have all sorts of intricate plans to get us out of debt, and they don't ever work. The people who get you into trouble are not likely to be the people who are going to get you out of trouble. It happens in business all the time. So business begins to fail because of poor leadership, and the leadership hangs on believing that they know the way to get out of the trouble. They got us into the trouble, and oftentimes they're removed. Educators, we see this all the time. We know the answer. And... Uh, uh, educators are the ones who bring education to us. It's not the parent, not the child, not the average citizen. And uh, try as they might, they don't have the understanding to get through with this. And they won't admit sometimes what the problems are. You say, are you being hard on politicians? No, I'm saying they're human. And it takes just like for you and for me, it takes something outside of myself to be able to have the wisdom and understanding to be a man, to be a father, a grandfather, a husband, to be a pastor, to be anything I'm going to be in my life. I can't do this on my own. I need the wisdom and the knowledge that God has. He knows the past from the future. He knows what's going to happen next. He knows what decisions are best for me when I have to make those decisions. And without him, I am a fool. Unfortunately for believers, we're often foolish, aren't we? You know what? When the Bible says all we like sheep have gone astray, well, that's not just one time. It takes the blood of Jesus Christ to continue to cleanse us from our sins and bring us to confession and bring us to a right relationship with God because I'm always trying to go back to the life that I once had and be as foolish as the person who doesn't want to acknowledge God in their lives. I think it's an interesting thing. You see, I know that there's a God and I know him through Jesus Christ, but I'm still given to wanting to be independent and making my own decisions. I need the Lord in my life. A lack of understanding, corruption. We tell ourselves, well, there's no God. There's no restraints in my life. I know it's wrong, but I'm going to do it anyway. Well, what does the Bible really and truly say about that? He says, don't you know in verse 4, don't you, the workers of wickedness know, that could be you and me today if we're not careful. <clears throat> they eat people as bread and don't call upon the name of the Lord. That's a reminder for me to remind you. I doubt I'm speaking to many uh, atheists today or this evening. I, I doubt that there are many atheists looking in at this broadcast unless somebody is under the, you know, under the leadership of the Holy Spirit and a real desire to get their lives right. And if you are, I, I hope God will bless you with this message. But you know, we often stray away from the Lord and act like, you know what, I don't need the Lord to make this decision. Jesus doesn't inform me here. I don't depend upon him here. I see this in Christian life because I see it in my life. And what I need to be reminded of is day by day and moment by moment, I need to walk in the comfort 
of the Lord. We, we don't want to put to shame the counsel of the Lord. If I can just turn briefly to Romans chapter 1 and just remind us of the solution that God gives to us. It's a, it's a great reminder. In Romans 3.10, it said, it's written, and notice what he says, none righteous, none who understands, none who seeks for God, none who turns aside, none who does good, not even one. Uh, he said, mouth is full of cursing and bitterness, feet are swift to shed blood, no fear of God, for all of sin comes short of the glory of God. That's what it says. But we are justified, how? As a gift of God. God looks down upon our helpless state, and instead of just boiling over in his wrath and consuming us, he said, I'm going to give you day after day. I'm going to give you the witness of nature. I'm going to speak deep within your heart. I'm going to speak by the witness of my people in the preaching of the gospel. I'm going to speak by billboards and TV preachers. I'm going to speak by uh, grandmothers and grandfathers and friends who will come and tell you the truth because I'm not willing for anybody to perish. You don't have to remain a fool. People can come to the Lord at any moment, at any time, no matter where they are, how far they are from God, or what they've done. In a moment, they can be cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ. He said he gives us his grace. He redeems us. He keeps us from his wrath and judgment. He gives us righteousness when we have unrighteousness. He said he does that. He reconciles us to him. I don't want us to ever think that God is in heaven waiting for us to make a mistake. And God is in heaven waiting to judge this world because of its sin. God is in heaven waiting for people to come to the one and only answer. Jesus said, I'm the way, I'm the truth and the life, and no man comes to the Father but by me. The fool, is, uh, the fool that said in his heart, there is no God. And Christians act foolishly when we say God doesn't care and God won't mind. Listen, we can be just as foolish as the atheist, can't we? What we need to do is be aware that God's great gift gives us the gift to, li gift to live in freedom and live under his blessing and authority so we can be the people he intends for us to be. And that's not only true for us, but that's true for the person who's farthest away from God today. Let's have the pity of God upon people who are acting foolishly and thinking foolishly and doing corrupt and evil things. Let's do what we can to lead them to Christ and touch their hearts in every way. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. But the wise man reveres God because the beginning of wisdom is to fear God, to know he's there and he's there for us. And he's given Jesus Christ to bring us all away from our separation back to a atonement and reconciliation with him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that in Jesus Christ we have all we ever require and need. All we ever require and need. Help us to be kind-hearted and tender, forgiving even, to people who don't love you, people who don't know you, people who act in their foolishness and bring great harm to all, even to us. May we be your witnesses, true disciples of yours, to spread this wonderful gospel to all nations and all people everywhere. Give us your heart, Lord, to love this world as you do and to share Christ as you have. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, what a great study. Next week we'll be right back in the Psalms, and I'm glad we could be together over this. Let's make sure we don't act foolishly by depending upon the Lord always and never straying from him. And let's make sure we don't judge those who are foolish, but in kindness and compassion, try to go to them and let the Lord use us to bring them to Christ so that they can be people of wisdom and not foolish. We'll see you next week.